Good morning. Uh, this morning we're going to be in Mark chapter 3. We're going to start in the first verse there, Mark 3. <clears throat> now up until this point, we have seen the Pharisees question the Lord on multiple occasions. The first time they questioned him was at, when he was feasting at Matthew's house after calling out Matthew or Levi. And they're asking him, how are you sitting here with these sinners? And after that, they questioned him about why his disciples, why don't they fast like John's disciples do? Why don't they fast like our, our other Pharisaical disciples do? They questioned him and his disciples about plucking corn. They were eating graphic on the Sabbath day. God, back in Exodus, he told them when they were eating manna in the wilderness, don't go out there and collect food for yourself on the Sabbath day. The Pharisees, they're asking him, this seems like it's against God's law. Why are you doing this? And we come to this part here in the beginning of Mark chapter 3, and they're questioning him again about this. Now, they don't overtly ask him a question as they did beforehand, but they're questioning him in their hearts. They're questioning what he's doing. <clears throat> so let's read it here together. Mark 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. There's the question right there. That's what they were, they were looking to do. They weren't there looking for answers. They weren't there worshiping God. They weren't there to, to give glory to his name. They were there seeing whether, what's he going to do? Now, on the Sabbath, he can't work. See, is he going to heal this man? They're looking to accuse him. That's, that's the heart. That's the root of what they're trying to do. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when, they had, when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto them, stretch forth, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. The root of what the Pharisees are trying to do here is they see Christ, they've seen some of the miracles he's done, they've heard some of the words he's preached, and they see all of this, his success and his power, him accomplishing his will and his purpose, and because of the enmity that is in their own soul, the enmity, the hatred they have for God, all they are concerned about is them losing their own glory and their own power and their own authority. They see Christ, this one who's coming, and he's doing his will, and they don't like that. So they're there, and they make sure that they're there when he is there so that they can accuse him, to try and entrap him and snare him in what he's doing. And there are three things that I want to look at this morning. I want to look at the Sabbath. We don't live in a day where, or a culture, a society, where we have a Sabbath law that is kept like the Jews did back in, in Christ's day here. So I want, to, I want to look at the Sabbath and the law, what a picture, the punishment around it, so that way you can understand the context of what these people are living in, what they're thinking and believing, the, the law they had. So we're going to look at the Sabbath. We're going to look at the question Christ poses to the Pharisees and the purpose of it, what that question was. And then we're going to look at the results of Christ's word. So the first thing here, we're going to look at the Sabbath. <clears throat> and in the previous message, we had looked at it a little bit and had mentioned and gone over some things. But I want to go through, and we're going to look at, several different chapters and passages throughout the Old Testament that clearly declare what the Sabbath is, where it started, what it came from, and they describe all it is and all what it's about to show us what the Sabbath picture is, why, we ha why God gave the Sabbath and why He gave the Sabbath law. So first we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 31, Genesis 1.31. Now, this is the first instance of this, this sanctified day of rest, this day that God, by His decree, set apart to be holy for His namesake, the day that He separated out from all the other days. Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. 
And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. There it is. He rested on the seventh day. Verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The Sabbath is God resting because God did the work. The work is done. It is finished. It is completed. There's nothing else to be done. It is totally finished. So God sanctified it, blessed it, and set it apart from all the other days. And that's a picture. We'll get into that as we go through here. Now turn ahead to Exodus chapter 16. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. And here we see the first instance of the usage of the word Sabbath, the first place where the word there is translated Sabbath. This is where you read it. It has the first instance, which sets the tone for when you see the word Sabbath all throughout the rest of the the Bible here. Exodus 16, verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over layeth up for you to keep until morning. And they laid it up till morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink. They're talking here about the getting the food ready. They laid it up as in the morning as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. Here, this passage, we're talking about you get this food, you prepare it on Saturday, on, excuse me, on Friday, so that on the seventh day, Saturday, it's all done. You're not going out there collecting food. That was the problem the Pharisees posed in the previous part where we saw in Mark where they were going through the fields plucking corn, eating food. God says here, only in this instance, this is the only time, all the other times, he said if you go out there on Wednesday to go get food and you want to collect double the amount of food for Thursday, all the food on Thursday morning, it's going to stink and it's going to have worms and it's going to be rotten. He doesn't give us food for Thursday on Wednesday. We get our bread day by day, except for when he says, you're going to rest on the Sabbath day. On the Sabbath day, you're going to have food that you prepared from the day before. That's the only time that you ever have food prepared ahead of time. In verse 25 there, and Moses said, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And here's, isn't this what we all want to do by nature? He told us exactly what he's going to do, and then God did exactly what he said he would do. But here in verse 27, And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather. They learned their lesson. In the past, he said, don't go out on Wednesday and collect food for Thursday. You're not going to find any. And some of them did, and they went out and or excuse me, uh, don't hoard it up. You're gonna, it'll rot and stink if you hoard it up for more than one day. And the people tried doing that in the past, some of them, and it stank, and they, they learned their lesson. God, I understand exactly what you're telling me. I'm going to get my food day by day. I will go out there every single day of the week, and I will get food. I'm not sure going to try and hoard it up for tomorrow. And so here when Moses says, on the sixth day, you're going to gather it for the seventh day, Some of them, we we learned our lesson last time. We're going to go out, and it's okay, I know you're saying that, but we we learned our lesson. We're going to go out on the seventh day, and we'll get food, because we need to get food each day. They went out, some people on the seventh day for to gather, and what did they find? They found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, Therefore, he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. So that's the first instance of the word there, Sabbath, where we see it explicitly used like that. Now we're going to look ahead uh, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. So flip a few pages up there to Exodus 20. And this is where God gives the formal law of the Sabbath, where he's in the smoking mountain there. 
This is the same place where God also gave the commandments, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not take the Lord of the of the Lord thy God in, in vain, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. Same place where God gave all those laws. This is where he gives the law of the Sabbath here. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant. Look at this here, not even your animals. Nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Nobody's working on the Sabbath day, not even your animals, no one. Verse 11, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So there he gives it, and now we're going to skip ahead again a few verses, or sorry, a few chapters up to Exodus 31, Exodus 31, verse 14. And here we see him where he finally, he's used the word Sabbath, he's given us that first picture back in Genesis, he's given the law on the smoking mountain, and now he gives the law, and he also declares what the punishment is for breaking this law. Exodus 31, and verse 14. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Skip ahead to verse 18. And he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of the communing with them upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. So now we have what the Sabbath law was. This is what the Pharisees, what they were living in their day and age, their culture, the society that the Jews had. This is the Sabbath that they were raised in, that they knew that they were to follow and to keep. <clears throat> but make no mistake, this law, a mandatory law, there's no way we can keep this law. It is absolutely impossible for us to keep it, especially in today's day and age. For, first of all, this law had to be observed on Saturday, which is the seventh day of the week, not Sunday, the first day of the week. We come and worship God on Sundays until you can make the first day the last day, there's no way that you can say, oh, well, I'm going to come to church on Sunday, so I'm keeping God's Sabbath. You're not keeping God's Sabbath. Sabbath is the end of the week, not the beginning. Also, on the Sabbath, no work can be done. Not by you, not by your children, not by your employees. We don't have man and maid servants like they had in that day, but we have employees, some of us. No one can do any work. It says not your cattle, no one. No work can be done of any kind. You can't even so much as prepare food or pick up sticks. There is nothing you can do. If you do it, you've broken God's law. Also, if we wanted to follow the Sabbath, that would also require us to return back to that ceremonial law, which also required a double sin offering, a double meal offering, and a double drink offering, all of which had to be offered at the temple in Jerusalem. And there's no way that any of us are doing that in today's time. You can go and read that in uh, Numbers 28, 9, and 10 where he goes over those, those offerings. And fourthly, those who insist on Sabbath keeping, to insist that I've got to follow God's law, I have to keep his Sabbath, I want to be righteous before God, that means that you must insist, you have to insist on the execution of everyone who breaks that law. Your son or daughter breaks that law, you have to make sure they're put to death if you want to follow God's law. He said that back there where we just read in Exodus 31, 15. But where are we now? And Galatians says, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith which should afterwards be revealed, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That's what this law was given here for. It's our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after that faith has come we're no longer under that schoolmaster 
For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That's a very easy picture for us to understand there. That law, it's our schoolmaster. is there for one reason, to bring us to Christ. When you're in school and your teacher tells you, hey, uh, you're going to write this essay, you're going to do this test, you have to read this book, whatever they give you to do, there's a sense of fear and respect there. Not that they're going to hurt you or anything, but just that they're the authority over you. They told you you need to do this thing. And so you're bound. You're underneath that schoolmaster. You have to do what it is they tell you to do. But now once you've graduated and you run into that same teacher or professor while you're out at Wegmans or ShopRite and they say, hey, you need, to, you need to do this, read this book, whatever. Okay. You're not under that law. You're not under that teacher anymore. You're out from school. You've graduated. You're done with it. Well, in the same manner here, the law, this was given to be our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That was the purpose of the law. <clears throat> and you say, well, you know, I get that, but it was still a good law, and maybe we should keep the, the Sabbath law there just in case. There's no just in case. You don't keep this law because, you know, it, it can't hurt us to follow the Sabbath. Let's keep Saturday or we'll keep it holy. The law, it was given for one purpose, to be that sign to direct us to Christ. And actually, as a matter of fact, then uh, turn here to Colossians 2, verse 16. This Sabbath day, we now are actually even strictly forbidden to keep this Sabbath day. Colossians 2, 16. Tells us, he writes here, let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of, what? The Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Christ fulfilled all the law. He fulfilled all the prophets. Our law keeping, it's finished in Christ. Our keeping the Sabbath law there's nothing for us to do there. Christ has done the law for us. We are complete in him. <clears throat> and knowing that this Sabbath was given for this one purpose and for this one purpose only, this revelation, God tells them here that it's sanctified. The picture, he's set his people apart. He has sanctified them, separated them wholly for his name, for his purpose, for his glory, <clears throat> so that he can be shown as both just and the justifier for his people. We are to rest in him. And this, this law, this Sabbath, it is one thing. It's a sign. It is, brought, it is here to bring us to Christ. And now we get that. We can see this because we can turn to Galatians and Colossians and all that. And you can clearly see, all right, this is a sign. This is a picture. It's like a schoolmaster. We get all this, but the Pharisees, when they're here and they're sitting there in the synagogue watching Christ to see what he's going to do, you say, okay, well, maybe they didn't know because they didn't have the New Testament at that point in time, so they didn't understand all these pictures. No, they understood exactly what was going on. <clears throat> he declares to us, go back to uh, Exodus 31 and verse 12. There's no possible way this law could have been misinterpreted. He declared to us, in the passage where he gave us the law, exactly what the law was for. <clears throat> Exodus 31, verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Why are we going to keep them? For it is a sign between me and you. Throughout your generations, what is this sign? What is this purpose? He said it's throughout all the generations. What is this sign? That ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. It's a sign to show you you're not the one who makes the difference. God set you apart. He chose his people, and he's the one who did it. Verse 16 <clears throat> Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's a beautiful word there. I just want to pause for a second. 
On the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. The word there is nafash. The definition, it means to breathe. Saying, in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he... It's done. It's finished. It's accomplished. <clears throat> so we've been taught, we've been warned... Go back to Colossians 2, verse 6. <clears throat> we've been taught what this Sabbath is, and we've been warned there's no more keeping of God's law. If you're in Christ, this law is done. There's nothing else for us to add. There's nothing else for us to do. There's no just in cases we should still keep this. <clears throat> Colossians 2, verse 6. As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. <clears throat> Excuse me. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. It's so easy to get spoiled that way, isn't it? Start, oh, well, let's look at the philosophical things, and you start looking at these things. <clears throat> and you just wander away and you just drift off looking after these things of the world and after the traditions of man going through these. It's very, so very easily to get spoiled after this vain deceit. And not after Christ. Verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. <clears throat> and what's it say there in the next verse? And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. Let me ask you a question. If something is complete, what else does it need? If something is finished, it is done, it is absolutely completed, what else does it need? And if something is still needed, if it needs something still, is it completed? Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. There is no possibility of a believer not entering into this Sabbath rest because God has done the work. He set apart His people and He sent His Son down from glory to be made born from a virgin like a little baby, just like Elias was born there. He, God Almighty, descended into being just like one of the creatures He made that needed milk to live from His mother. He sent him down, and he lived <clears throat> and performed all his Father's will and died, being made one with us. We died in him, and he rose again, so that salvation is done. There's nothing else for us to do. We are complete in him. And being complete in him, he will ensure that all of his people will be brought into this Sabbath rest, the Sabbath peace. Turn with me to, to Hebrews 4, verse 3. <clears throat> As his people, as his believers, we can confidently, peacefully rest assured that he will do this thing of rest and peace for us, <clears throat> for our souls. Hebrews 4.3, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. This thing was done before he made the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. <clears throat> and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, you who are entered into Christ's rest, you he hath also ceased from his own works. It's complete. There's nothing else to do. We're in his rest. We cease from our works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest 
lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So now seeing this Sabbath law, seeing the picture that it was, seeing the sign that it was given for, seeing that it was given to bring us to Christ, clearly stated in the Old Testament in multiple passages and then further expounded upon later on, seeing what the Sabbath is, let's go back to our text now and read again what happened here. So Mark 3, verse 1. This is the same synagogue he was in there earlier where he performed some of his previous miracles. Mark 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he said unto them, He's talking to the Pharisees here. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. <clears throat> Christ, our Sabbath, has come. He finished all the work, and He is here as our rest. It is in Him, our rest, that He lawfully did good. He did the whole law perfectly obedient before His Father. And it is in Him, our rest, that He saved life. He saved His people alive from so great a condemnation. It is in Him, our rest, that we have hope of eternal salvation. God made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temple made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needeth anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations for men to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations. He established everything, he set the boundaries, he appointed all things. Nothing happens outside of God's purpose. Even here where it's talking about the hardness of their hearts. Yes, they willfully hardened their hearts, but that wasn't by surprise. God purposed for it to happen that way, the same way he purposed for Pharaoh to harden his heart against Moses. <clears throat> that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and in him we move, and in him we have our being. Christ is all. He is the Sabbath. He is that sign. We just read what the Sabbath was. We looked at all those different things about the Sabbath law and the punishments and all the different pictures that it, that it was there for. <clears throat> and this one sign, it was to picture Christ, who he accomplished at Calvary, the eternal life through perfect obedience. And what are we left to do? Having, him having done all this, what's left for us to do? Rest. That's it. It's complete. It's done. Now, naturally speaking, we don't see this. Naturally speaking, when this gospel of peace and rest is preached to us, when we're here, God's done it all. There's nothing for else for us to do. It's complete. And if it's complete, that means it's complete. It's done. That's the gospel. Done. But naturally... We hear this gospel, and just like the Pharisees, I, I don't like that. Let's see if we can find something to accuse him. He's got to slip up at some point in time here. That's all they were seeking there. <clears throat> but, what did it say there? When Christ asked them this question, because they knew the answer to that question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? Christ's questions, his words, his actions... The Pharisees knew exactly where they stood before him. There was no doubt in their mind. Sometimes he overtly declared it, and sometimes he asked questions, and you can just see based off of how they responded that they knew exactly where it was that they stood before him. It says, but they held their peace. <clears throat> when we hear that Christ has done it all, when we hear that our works are nothing, our law-keeping won't save us, and rather us trying to strictly try and keep the law is only going to further condemn us. Our initial reaction, 
I've never heard anything like that before. I don't know what to say. We're just speechless like them. Turn with me to Galatians 3, verse 10. Galatians 3, verse 10. <clears throat> For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that, what does it say there? No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And skip down to verse 18. For, the inheritance, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. If our inheritance, if eternal salvation and glory dwelling and worshiping with God and all, Almighty in heaven forever. If that inheritance is by the law, then it's no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given by which, which could have given life, if God gave this law and there was some way that we could get life by this law, verily righteousness should have been by the law. This law, it can't save us, and we can't keep this law to save ourselves. This leaves us speechless, like it said there, but they held their peace. And what's the next thing that we're reading about there? What's the next reaction? the hardness of their hearts. We hear this scripture, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that grace, excuse me, moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. This work that Christ he did the work. The works were done throughout the time. And on the seventh day he rested, telling us to rest. Christ has done it all. That's very offensive to us. And initially we don't know what to say. And soon after, it hardens our hearts. We just get even more angry with God when he tells us, there's nothing for you to do. There's nothing for you to glory in. There's nothing to boast in. Christ has done it all. Rest in Christ. <laughs> Our prayer is knowing how easily this is in every single one of our own hearts. Our prayer is, God, do your will. He says in Ezekiel, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh. Lord, take that stony heart out of my flesh, please, Lord. And will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them. They shall be to me, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. God, you've shown me what I do. You've shown me that I can do nothing. You've shown me that in Christ, all of this is done. In Christ, I am saved. In Christ, I am kept. In Christ is all the glory. I have nothing to do. Lord, please do your will. If you don't do your will, if you do not perform this work, I'm without hope. I have nothing if you don't do this. If I can't rest in you, I will never rest. So let's look at the results here <clears throat> at the end of our passage there in, uh, in Mark chapter 3, verse 5 there. Before, before I go there, look at this picture here. This man, he had a withered hand. How many of you Think of your jobs, what you do on a daily basis. When you go to work, what is it that you're doing? If you were to lose the ability of your hands so that you can't do anything, 
What would it be exactly that you would be able to do? What would you be able to accomplish? What if, what if you just lost one of your hands? What, if, what would you be able to accomplish in life? Our hands, that is the means by which we accomplish work. That is the means by which we do everything that we do. This man, his hand was withered. That's a beautiful picture of his people when he's made him to know. My hand's withered. I can't, I know I can't do any work. I could try, but I don't have the ability. I physically don't have the hands to do any work with. And what did he do? This man with the withered hand, it says Christ went again into the synagogue and there was a man with a withered hand there. He knew by his hand, by his, he has no ability to do works. So he went where? To the place where God is worshipped to find someone else who can do a work for him. Mark 3 verse 5 here. And Christ says to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And when Christ says that to you, who he's made known, that you have a withered hand, you who know there's no way you can do this work of salvation. There's nothing you can do. When he says, stretch forth thine hand, he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. The Pharisees here, they thought they had life. They thought their arms, just like in how they re responded and behaved in the previous passages, they thought they had big, strong arms that they could do all the work that they needed to do, and they could accomplish mighty things by the works of their hands. Those who come to God by works, they think that they have a life. They think that they have something that they can afford God, that they can say, God, now I followed your law, and I, I did these things. I kept your Sabbath, and you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm law-keeping. I do all these things. And God says, get your filthy rags away from me, you vile person. And to the man that went to the house of God, knowing his hand is withered, knowing this is the only place he's going to find peace and rest. Those who come to God knowing that there is no work that they can do, knowing there is nothing they contribute to salvation, knowing that Christ saved his people, he has done it all, they can rest. They can come to one who says, stretch forth thine hand, and he restores it so that in him we're restored whole. In him we're complete. We're made whole by Him, we're saved by Him, and it is in Him, through Him, and for Him that He does this. And this brings us to know that none of us have a free will. There's nothing we can do. These Pharisees, they thought, you know, we keep the law. We're going to see if Christ here is going to try and heal this man there. We're going to see what He does here. You can't come to God by your works, and you can't come to God by your free will. And there is no free will. There are only two wills. Either you're under the bondage, you're in that yoke, you're bound by nature to either serve your flesh, serve the lusts of your flesh in sin, just working your way and constantly, constantly knowing your conscience is screaming at you, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. There is nothing I can do to come to God that is good enough by my hands. Either we're in that camp or we're under his yoke. And his yoke, it's a light yoke. It is an easy yoke. It is a yoke of love. By God's grace, he makes us to put off the old lusts of the flesh. Now, I'm not saying that once a believer, you never sin again. No, he gives us a new heart. We still have that old one with us. But he puts us in a place where we just willingly knowing what he's done for us, want to slip on his yoke, want to slip on his... He gives us that new nature that we want to follow after his manner. And it says there that we'll follow after his statutes and ordinances. What are these statutes and ordinances that he's talking about there that we just read about? Or that, excuse me, that I read to you from Ezekiel there where he says, they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Those statutes and ordinances... Let's have a couple of verses here and we'll be done. Turn to John chapter 15. Those of us to whom he says, stretch forth thine hand, those of us he heals and restores, and he says, I will take this stony heart out of them, the hardness of their hearts. I'm going to take that out of them and I'm going to give them a soft heart of flesh that they may walk and keep mine ordinances and statutes. John 15, 10. 
And if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved. Turn back a couple to John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. By the law of love, I don't have time to read through the whole thing, but I'll just paraphrase it. No, I'll read it. In 1 Peter 1.22 he says, Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Fervently is the key word there. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. Grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. This is how we live. This is how we give thanks to God. This is how we support and help our brethren. This yoke that he puts us under, it's a light and easy yoke because it is a yoke of love. <clears throat> to do his will, to love his people, and to be at unity and peace with them. This Sabbath, it was given there to be a rest. That's what he puts us in, rest. <clears throat> so there's the result. Um, I'll run through this quickly. That was the result of those who hear this word that are his people, and he makes it effectual to them. What is the result to the Pharisees? Those people who hear this word, and they have first they have nothing to say, then their hearts are hardened, they hear this word. This word is powerful. Verse 6 there in our, in our text, Mark 3, verse 6, it says, And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. There's no way you hear his gospel. If you hear what his gospel says, if you hear his gospel preached, you will do one of two things. You will rejoice in peace under that yoke of love and just rest in Christ, or you're going to take counsel against us how you're going to destroy him. But there's no middle ground. There's no lukewarmness with God. Either you'll be under this, you'll hear this message, and it will bring you peace, or you'll hear this message, and it's going to bring you anger and wrath. But if you hear this message, you're going to be in one of the two camps. There is no neutral stances on the gospel. Either you love God or you're conspiring against him. There is no in between. Let's pray.